Hello. How's everyone doing? Let me make sure. Yep, the mic is on. Okay. So welcome back to CS3200. Um, we are currently learning about reinforcement learning. Last class, we did an introduction to reinforcement learning, talked about some of the terminology that we were going to use and the overview of how reinforcement learning works. And this time, what we're going to talk about is some of the algorithms or an introduction to the algorithms that we're going to use to actually solve reinforcement learning. And specifically, um, we're going to be talking about something called bandit algorithms. And I'll see, and bandit algorithms are going to help us solve the problem that we talked about last time of exploration versus exploitation. And unfortunately, last class, I said that I was going to be able to show off um, some of the Minimax Connect 4 tournament, but that's going to have to be on Tuesday because the markers aren't quite done with that yet. So on Tuesday of next week, so five days from now, the stream, we're going to end the stream with the tournament of all the Connect 4 bots that you wrote for Assignment 3. So that should be really fun. And I will also announce the fastest solutions for Assignment 2. Okay, so let's get into the lecture. And this is going to be on... Uh, bandit algorithms and exploration versus exploitation. So what am I doing here? PowerPoint. Let's get into the PowerPoint and let's start this up. Someone asked, will the stream be back to the regular time next week? Uh, so for next week, it will still be the late time. Okay, so the late time next week and then after that we'll be back to the early time. Okay, so Lecture number 14, uh, explo exploitation versus exploration and bandit algorithms that are going to help us solve that problem. So just as a, a recap of what the exploitation versus exploration problem is, one of the main challenges in reinforcement learning is the trade-off between exploitation and exploration. So to obtain a lot of reward, our agents are going to prefer actions that they know produce good results. But in order to learn which of those actions actually produce good rewards, then you have to try them out first. And so the agent has to exploit knowledge that it has, but also explore in order to gain more knowledge. And this is one of the main challenges in, in real life, um, for example. So we talked about last time the example of going out to a restaurant, right? Um, and so you may, if you want to get some food, you want to go out for food, you could say, well, am I going to go with like my favorite restaurant, which I've had a bunch of times before and I know that I'll like it, or can I explore and, and maybe go to a new restaurant in hopes that that one will also be good and maybe it'll even be my new favorite, right? So a lot of the times in life, even in relationships, right? Maybe I have a, a good relationship going, but maybe there's something out there that's better, right? This is a dangerous question to ask, but um, it's true. You're always, even in your job, right? Maybe your job has decent pay, you like your coworkers, but maybe there's a better job out there for you somewhere. Or maybe there's a worse job out there for, for, you, for you somewhere. So it's, it's a really important question in life is how to deal with this um, exploitation versus exploration problem. Okay, so we've talked a lot about learning. We've talked about machine learning, we've, we've floated the idea of reinforcement learning, but let's just quickly go into what learning actually means from the context of this course. Because when we start to create these algorithms that are going to help us solve problems, um, we want to know what we mean actually when we say learning in order to write a learning algorithm. So learning is the process of gaining or modifying existing knowledge, okay? So we have learned something if we have information that we didn't have before, right? So maybe you learn to ride a bike. So at one point you didn't know how to ride a bicycle and then through practice and training you have learned how to ride a bicycle. Or maybe you didn't know how to do long division at one point and then through uh, your math class, you learned to do long division. So you've gained some more knowledge uh, about a particular topic. So 
even if we try something out and we're gaining the same results, we learn to trust them with more certainty. So what this means is, let's say that, um, what's a good example? Can't come up with a good example right now. But let's say, for example, uh, we're playing a game and a certain action could have a, a specific value, right? So we'd get a specific reward. So let's say we think the reward is going to be 10. Even if we try the action again and we get another 10 and another 10, we've still learned something even though it's the same thing we thought before. And the thing that we have learned is that we are now more certain about the value of that action, right? So even if we don't get a new value, we still learn something because we know more about the statistics around that value. So what is exploitation? Exploitation is our ability to exploit our current knowledge. And what that means is that we're going to choose a high valued action for which we already have an estimate of the value. Exploitation is low risk and low reward possibly. So we know, excuse me, we know what we're going to get. Maybe it's a low reward, maybe it's a medium reward, but the point is it's usually low risk, right? It's low risk going to your favorite restaurant. It's very high risk to go to a new restaurant. Risk meaning that the variance could be really high, right? So you could go to a new place, it could be really bad, it could be really good, it could be okay. And so if we always choose actions that we are familiar with, it gives us very little new information, right? So if we keep going to that favorite restaurant, we never get new information about other restaurants, for example. Exploration. So exploration is trying actions that we haven't tried before, or it's trying actions that we have tried less frequently than actions we have tried more frequently. Um, and exploration helps us to learn those values, okay? So as we try them more and more, as we try these new actions more and more and more, we get new rewards, we get new values, and we can update our belief about the value of those actions. And it's possible that the new actions have higher rewards than previously selected. Now, it's also possible that they have lower rewards, right? But the point is, we're trying them in order to learn whether or not the new values are uh, better or worse than other actions that we could possibly take. So once we have explored sufficiently, and what sufficiently means, you know, we'll talk about in the future, what we can do is after we've explored everything a significant amount, then what we can do is start exploiting the best actions and then we can know that they're the best actions. So what that means is maybe you spend your whole life visiting, visiting every restaurant in town 10 times to get a good sample and then you can start going to your favorite restaurant, right? Because you know what they're all like. All right. So the canonical example of this sort of problem is called the N-armed bandit problem. And if you've ever um, seen a slot machine, who out there in the chat has ever played a slot machine? If you have played a slot machine, then you know where the term bandit comes from, okay? So it's a bandit because it steals your money. <laughs> but the point is, a slot machine, you are pulling a lever and you're getting some reward. A lot of the time that reward will be low, sometimes it'll be high, sometimes it'll be negative, etc. And the N armed bandit problem, so this arm, old slot machines used to have to pull down an arm to start the, the wheel spinning, now you just push a button. But this is the N armed bandit problem, where you're going to have N different slot machines, and you're basically trying to choose which slot machine to pull. And so that's why it's called the N armed bandit problem, where N is some number. So the n-armed bandit problem is repeatedly making a choice among n different actions. After each action, you receive a reward from a stationary probability distribution depending on the action. And what that means is, let's say, for example, um, this machine 
is going to, you're going to win one out of every five times. Maybe the second machine, you're going to win one out of every ten times. Maybe you win every time with the third machine, and maybe you lose every time with the fourth machine, right? So you're trying to come up with an algorithm to come up with a sequence of actions that can best learn these values. And so how can you do that? And algorithms that solve the unarmed bandit problem are going to come in handy for us. And so here the object is to maximize your expected total reward over a number of selected actions. So again, let's say each play of the slot machine costs a dollar. And I charge you with the following problem. I'm going to give you a hundred dollars and you best figure out how you're going to play each machine. Okay, so you're going to give me the sequence of actions that you'll take with those hundred dollars, with those hundred plays. So that's what we're meaning by trying to solve the n-armed bandit problem. And so really what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out the value of each action, right? Because the value of each action is sort of the average return from each machine. And so the, the average value for the one that wins once every five pulls is going to be higher than the one that wins once every 10 pulls. But the one that wins every pull is going to be the highest value, obviously. And we are trying to figure out those values so that in the future, when we make more decisions, we know which action to take. Okay, so this is called the multi-armed bandit problem. Um, and the name is an analogy to slot machines, right? They're called one-armed bandits, and so we go with the n-armed bandit. And let's say you have a limited amount of money and you want to win as much as possible. And so how do we select which levers to pull, right? And this problem is everywhere. Um, we're gonna see it in one of our assignments when it comes to pathfinding. Um, so in that problem, we're gonna say like, which direction do we head in, up, down, left, or right, in order to gain the most information that will ideally lead us toward the goal? Um, on some game shows or some parts of life, you might be uh, presented with, you know, the, the different doors and maybe the last time I walked through this door, I got a million dollars, maybe I got eaten by a tiger, right? It's, it's a hard decision. So we want to come up with algorithms for decision making. Okay. So, again, back to E versus E. If we maintain an estimate of action values, then at any time there is one or possibly many tied greatest value, right? And if there is a greatest valued action at any given time, which we know there will be, that's called the greedy action, okay? It's the greedy action because taking that action is greedy because I know it on average, it will give me the highest reward. So exploitation is choosing the greedy action. So choosing the greedy action maximizes your single action returns. All right, so that's me, that means that if you know that one of them has your current highest value, then pulling that one is ideally going to give you the maximum reward on that action. Exploration then is choosing a non-greedy action to improve your action estimates. And that's required for future reward maximization, right? Because you need to be able to explore to gain more information about other things. And we'll show you an example of that uh, a little bit later. So how do you balance exploitation versus exploration? Well, when it comes to the actual implementation of these algorithms, there's two very important concepts. The first concept is how do we store and update the value estimates as we learn over time from new information? So how do we actually store and update that information? And the second part is, based on that information of our value estimates, how do we choose which action to do next based on our current estimates, okay? So the first thing, how do we update and store our estimates and the second thing is, how do we choose an action based on our current estimates? Okay, so here's one class of um, methods called action value methods. And so how do we store the current value estimates? Okay, what we're gonna do 
is we're going to have this value called Q. It's going to be a Q value. Um, Q star of A, remember what we, what we said about star? Star is like the actual value of something. So if we had an oracle or if a, a deity could tell us what the actual value was, that would be Q star of A. So Q star of A is the actual value of action A. And the actual value here, meaning the average or mean reward, okay? Since we don't know the actual value of an action, we will never really actually know Q star of A, right? Because we're not an oracle. And so what we will know is Q sub T of A. And as we take more, remember what we talked about T? So T is a current time step. So T is zero at the beginning, and then T is one after our first action, two after our second action, and it will be T after T actions. So QT of A is the estimate of Q star of A after time step T. So for example, Q10 of A is our estimate of the value of action 10 or, or of that action A after 10 time steps. And we'll I'll walk through an example of this to make it really obvious what I'm talking about. So Q value implementation. Let's take the n-armed bandit problem as an example. So Q of A is going to be the estimate of bandit A's reward. So choosing a bandit is going to be one action. Okay, so Q can be an array of size n. So how are we gonna actually store these things? Well, if we have n one-armed bandits, right? So here we're gonna have four slot machines. What we can do is we can start out with Q0 and Q0 is going to be our estimates of the values of all the actions at time zero before I have taken any actions. So let's just say, for example, um, and we have to fill this out with some values. So in some cases, well, most cases, we're gonna fill these out with zeros, okay? So our estimate of the value of each action is going to be zero. And that's what this represents. So Q0 of action zero is zero, Q0 of action one is zero, Q0 of action three and action four are zero. And then after some number of time steps, we are somehow going to get rewards and we are somehow going to update these values. And so maybe after T time steps, my QT of two, right, zero, one, two is 22. And so after some number of time steps, um, my estimate of action, my estimate of the value of this action is 22. All right, so let's go through and we'll do an example on the blackboard. So let's bring up the blackboard and we'll walk through an example. All right, so here, uh, let me just check. Um, so just to take a quick time out, uh, I see that there's a few questions in the chat, but, uh, the questions are probably from people not in the course. So I will answer questions that I think are relevant to the current part of the lecture, but I don't feel that those questions are relevant right now, but I'll get back to them once the lecture is over. Okay. So here we've got four bandits. I've labeled them here. One, two, three, and four. So those are our bandits. Um, as we pull levers on the bandits, what's gonna happen is we're gonna get rewards, okay? And down here on the bottom, what we're going to have is our current Q values. So let's just say that I'm gonna set all of those Q values to zero, right? So this is my estimate. So this is Q zero of of each bandit. It's Q zero because this is time step zero, right? So this is T equals zero. All right, so that's what that is at the bottom. I have values, um, those are my Q values and they're all currently zero. So back to the slide, if we go back to the slide, which I won't, um, that was the array that I originally had. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm somehow going to choose one of these bandits to pull, okay? So someone in the chat, give me a bandit number to pull. Just say a number one through four. 
Okay, so someone said four, and that was the first one. So we're going to pull bandit number four. Now, let's come up with some different distributions for these bandits, all right? Um, so, let's say that bandit number one is always going to give me um, a value of five, okay? Now, I'm coming up with these on the fly, and we're going to try and figure out uh, how to best go through this, all right? So, let's say this one is going to give me uh, 20 or negative 20, right? This one might give me, let's say, uh, a random number from 1 to 10. And this one might always just give me, like, negative 1. Let's see what happens with this, okay? So the person in the chat said that we're going to pull the lever uh, random from 1 to 10. So what's going to happen here? Actually, let me, let me say 1 to 20. Let's say rand 1 to 20, just to give it a little bit um, better value. And then here we have negative 1. So this is what's going to happen when we put, when we pull these levers. Okay. Actually, one more, one more quick change. Let's say this is going to be rand 1 to 8. Perfect. Okay. So we've pulled lever 4, and now we're going to get a random value between 1 and 20. Let's say, just, I'm just pulling this out of my head, let's say that we get 17, right? So, now we used to think that the value of action 4 was 0, but what do we think it is now? What's one way that we could update these values? Can someone in the chat say how I might now update my belief of the value of action 4 after I've gotten a reward of 17. Anyone have any, any ideas out there? No ideas? Okay. So, what I'm going to do is just propose that we use the average. Okay, so the average of everything we've done so far, that's what I'm going to put down here. So, let's put uh, the new value down here is going to be 17. So, boop, boop, boop. let's erase that. Oh, geez, am I going to have to do this every time? Uh, hopefully not. We'll see. Uh, there we go. Now we're going to put in 17. Perfect. Okay. Now what we have to do is the following. Based on our current values, which lever do we want to pull? Well, it, it looks like we probably want to pull this one again, right? Because it has the highest value among all the, the actions that we have. So this is one of the first issues, is that typically what we want to do is try everything once. So let's just say we do that. So we've decided we're going to try everything once before we try anything twice. And the reason for that is because if we keep just pulling the highest valued lever, we'll actually never pull any of these levers. So that's bad. So let's say we pull action one, well, we're always going to get five. Here, let's say we got negative 20 from here. And let's say we got uh, an 8. We got really lucky over here, okay? So now, down here, um, we've got a value of 5. Oh, geez, this is going to be hard to update every time. Um, let me just do this. All right, so we're typing this in black now because I don't, I don't have the patience to do that. So we got 5. We've got a value of negative 20 here. We've got 8 here and we've got 17 over here. Okay, so now what we have to do is decide which action to pull. So let's say I've given you 10 pulls, right? So we're just, we're just deciding um, 
I, I don't have any algorithm yet. I'm sort of going on my own intuition. So I've tried everything once. Um, so maybe my intuition tells me, okay, let's actually try everything twice. Okay, so I'm going to pull another five here. Um, let me go back to, to white for a second. So I pull this one again, I'm going to get a five. Here this time I'm going to get 20. Um, here this time maybe I get a seven. And here this time maybe I get a one. Right? So if I come down here now and I erase these and I update the values, what I'm going to get is... I'm going to have the same value of 5 here, here I'm going to have a value of 0, here I'll have 7.5, and here I'll have 9. Okay? So this is the process that we're going through. If we're choosing to average things, then we're going to, let's say, for example, now I'm going to pull um, this lever again over here, and I'm going to get a value of 3. Maybe I get unlucky. And so now the average of what is it? 3, 4, 21 divided by 3. Now this is 7. Right? So now this one down here will be 7. So let me just update that. Right? So you can see how these values or these averages are going to update themselves. They're going to fluctuate over time. Some of these, uh, some of these bandits up here are going to have like really high variance possible returns. Some of them may be returning the same thing every time. Some of them may be like completely random. And so we have to keep these estimates over time. And ideally, what we learn over time is the true average. So let's say I've gone through and I've pulled every lever a million times. So what would the values down here be if I've pulled everything a million times? Can anyone out there in the chat help me with these values? So obviously, if I pull the always 5 lever a million times, then that one's going to give me 5, right? Because no matter how many times I do it, I'm going to get that 5, and so my, my thought about its value will never change. Here, I'm going to keep seeing either 20 or negative 20. So if I go to infinity, well, this is going to give me an average value of 0, right? The average value between 1 and 8, so if I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, then the average value there is going to be 4.5. And if I go to a million on this one, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, yeah, so this will be like, I can't, uh, is it, if it's 10 or 10.5, I can't exactly remember. Um, so it'll be... 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, yeah, 10.5. So what we will see over time as we keep pulling more and more levers is that we will eventually get close to this Q star value, right? So this is actually Q star down here, which is, which is what we talked about, the actual values of this problem. All right. So when we talk about Q values and updating Q values and getting rewards, this is the process that we're talking about for the n-armed bandit problem. And it turns out that this is going to be the way that we update things even in much more complex problems. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint slides. So that was the bandit example. And when I was talking about here, I said, okay, we're going to start out with uh, values of zeros for everything, and then at some point we will have estimates, right? That's the process that we were going through, was what I just showed on the blackboard. Okay, so there are two types of estimation methods that we can use um, in order to keep track of values. One, well, there's many of them, but these are two of the main ones. The first one is called sample average estimation, and the other one is called incremental update estimation. So sample average estimation. A natural way of calculating QT of A is to average the rewards received so far after a certain number of plays. And that's what we just did, actually. So our example, we just did that. So if at play T, Action A has been chosen KA times, re yielding the rewards R1 through RKA. Then what we have is QT of A, so our estimate at time T of the value of action A, is equal to the sum of all those rewards divided by the number of times that that bandit has been chosen. Okay. 
If Ka equals zero, then we define Qt as some default value, Qt of A equals zero. As Ka gets large, then Qt of A converges to Q star of A. And so since we're, since we're averaging the samples, then this is the sample average method. Really, really easy. So let me swap back over to the blackboard real quick because what we were just doing here was the sample average method exactly, right? So here we had um, Ka equal two because this bandit was chosen twice. Here we have Ka equal two. Um, here we also have Ka equal two and here we had Ka equal to three, right? And so down here, what we had was um, five plus five divided by two, right? That's R1 plus R2 divided by Ka. So that's, that was our average. Here we have negative 20 plus 20 divided by two. Here we had eight plus seven, sorry, eight plus seven divided by two. And over here we had 17 plus one plus three divided by three. And so that's the formula we used to get the average, right? So we had to keep a list of all the rewards that we had returned for each one. And we also had to keep a size of that list. And then in order to update our QT of, of the values, we had to sum up everything in the list and divide it by the number of things in the list. And that was how we got the average. So super simple, but some of the terminology is a little bit new, like QT of A and KA and stuff like that. So we just talked about the sample average method, but let's now go to the incremental action value estimate, which is it's a little bit more complex, but you can see how we might want this in the future. So if we recall what we just did, was that the value estimate at time t of an action was equal to the sum of all the actions or all the rewards of that action divided by the number of times we chose that action, right? But in order to compute that, we need to store all of the rewards and that's really annoying. Okay. We don't, we don't want to have to store all the rewards. Let's say we do like a billion time steps in our reinforcement learning algorithm. We don't want to have to store a billion different integers and then add them all and divide them, right? We want to be able to update the estimate of our average incrementally rather than have to store all these values. And so this is a bit of an optimization. So the problem is that the memory and computational requirements of this method grow over time. And we want this to be like a constant time update. We don't want it to get slower every time we add a new reward. So let's derive an incremental formula so that memory is no longer an issue. And what I want to do here is the following. So what we have already says that the new average, so QT of A, the new average is a function of the history of all the samples, right? So that's what we have now. Our average is a function based on the history of all the samples, but that's bad because as the history gets larger, it takes longer to compute. But what we want, which would be ideal, is if the new average was a function of just the old average and the new sample. Okay, so for example, if we could just take the old average and the new sample and we could update that, then that would be perfect. So let's see if we can do that. All right, so there's going to be some math warning. There is math on this slide. Okay, and you should understand this math for an exam. Hint, hint. So here's the formula that we started with. Um, our estimate at time k of our value is going to be equal to the sum of all the rewards, reward one, two, three, four, five, up to k divided by k. That's just the formula for the average of something. It's the sum of them all divided by the number of them. Let's change that into the summation notation, right? So we have the sum from i equals one to k of r sub i. That's what's inside here. 
and then we divide that all by k, but we're going to put that at the front instead of at the end. Okay? So this is the sum of all the rewards from i equals 1 to k divided by k. Really simple. So, if we wanted to find the new average, which is instead of qk, right, it's qk plus 1. So this would be the new average that we're trying to find. Well, what we would have to do before is the same thing. We would have to just add everything up again. But we'll see how we can get away from that. So here, if we're trying to find qk plus 1, well, we just take this formula that we just had and we substitute in k plus 1 for k, right? Really easy. So this one is the sum from i equal 1 to k plus 1 of reward i divided by k plus 1. All we did is substitute in k. Okay. What we're going to do now is we're going to get a little bit tricky. And where before I said that it went from i equals 1 to k plus 1, now we're just going to say it's i equal 1 to k, and we're going to pull the k plus 1 reward outside of the summation. All right? You might say, why are we doing that? Well, that will become obvious when I do a bit of the later math. Now look at this. This is really interesting. We'll go to the next line. If we have the sum of i equal 1 to k of ri, look where we had this before. So this term right here, let me circle it for you. This term right here, compare that to this term right here. It's the same thing, right? Okay, so qk was equal to 1 over k times that. So what we're going to do is now we have, if we have 1 over k plus 1 on the outside, then we're going to bring k inside. And so this term, we can replace this term here by k times qk, right? Because this, look, uh, I don't want to draw too much on this, but if we want, so qk was equal to, okay, qk was equal to 1 over k times this, so if I bring this k over here, like this, then I have k times qk equals this term. So what I do now is I substitute k times qk for that term inside the equation. That's what I'm doing in this step. I hope that was clear. I, I kind of explained it two different ways. I think the, the most recent way was the easiest. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange these two terms. So I'm just bringing this one over here, and I'm bringing this one over here. Okay, so I haven't done anything there. And also, I'm going to do a little bit more math trickery, where I'm going to add qk and subtract qk. So, in essence, this does nothing, right? Because it's going to sum to zero, so I'm allowed to do that. But this is going to allow me to rearrange some things in a really nice way. So how is that going to work? Well, I still have the rk plus 1. I've brought that down. But now what I had before was k times qk plus qk. So that's k plus 1 times qk. So these two terms get brought down into here. So that's k plus 1 times qk. And then on the outside, I still have this minus qk. Now what I have is I have a 1 divided by k plus 1 on the outside, and I have a k plus 1 times this on the inside. So those can cancel out, and I can bring this qk term outside, and then what I'm left with is 1 over k plus 1 times r k plus 1 minus qk. So what that means is that I, have, I now have an incremental formula for qk plus 1, which instead of being the summation of all these things, right, which gets bigger and bigger over time, it's a formula which only depends on the previous value of qk, the value of k itself, so how many samples, and also the new reward. 
Okay, so see how that worked? We've gone, we've gotten rid of the need to sum all of these values by basing it all based on the, the previous value. So, QK is the average of the first K rewards. QK plus one was equal to this formula, which is equal to QK plus one over K plus one times RK plus one minus QK. And what this really means is the following. The new estimate, right? Because k plus 1 is the new time step. k was the old time step. So the new estimate is equal to the old estimate, qk, plus some step size. In this case, it's 1 over k plus 1 times the new sample minus the old estimate. So the new sample is referred to the target value. Okay, so this step size here of 1 over k plus 1, that's just one of many different possible step sizes that we could use. But if we do use exactly 1 over k plus 1, then the new estimate will be exactly equal to the average of all the samples. Alrighty. Now, let's talk about something called a non-stationary problem. So averaging works fine for stationary problems, but not if the reward is going to change over time. So we want to weight recent rewards more than old one in case it's a non-stationary problem. And so what do I really mean by this? Let me bring up the blackboard again. Okay. so. Let's say that we've done a million samples for each, um, for each of these bandits. Let me get my brush up again. Okay, so let's say I've done like a million samples for each bandit. Now, if I've done a million samples for each bandit, then I'm going to have a Q value of 10.5 over here. But what happens if after a million samples, I change this so that it always gives me a value of 100? Just for example, right? So after I've played a million times, some software update comes to this bandit and says, all right, this slot machine is always going to give me a reward of 100. Well, if I've pulled a million levers, and gotten an average of 10.5, and let's say it's always giving me 100, well, my average is going to not be changing very much because I've done it a million times. I'm very sure that it's it has a value of 10.5. And so even though I'm getting all these new values of 100, maybe after like 100 a hundreds, my average might change to like 10.6, right? Because what's happening here is I'm trusting all of the old values, all those million previous values, as much as I'm trusting the new values. And so trusting all of the values equally, no matter when they happened, that's fine if I have a stationary problem. So a stationary problem is one in which these distributions never change, okay? But if they do happen to change, then what I should probably want is I should weight the new values somehow higher than the old values. See how that works? So that's called a non-stationary problem. So we do have a bit of a solution for this and I'm gonna go over it, okay? So what we can do is instead of using um, one, so before we had this same formula, except for our A, it was one over K plus one. Okay, so this was our previous value for alpha here. And so when we have a value of 1 over k plus 1, this is the average. So it's weighting every pull the same. Because what's happening is, every time we get a new pull, we're weighting it less and less. So it means it's, it's eventually weighting everything the same. 
But for non-stationary problems, what we actually want to do is keep a constant step size parameter. So instead of 1 over k plus 1, which whose value will change as k increases, what we want to do is have a, a fixed value here. So that means that the new estimate will be the old estimate plus some constant times the new sample minus the old sample. And this is much easier to understand once I show you a visual example. So let's, let's do that in a second. Okay, so here's an example. Or, sorry, this is the formula that we just used. So the new estimate is essentially going to be pulled toward rk plus 1 by a value of alpha. And let me show you how that works. So let's say that we have a qk equal to 50. So our old estimate was that the average value was 50, right? That the old estimate was 50. If we have an alpha value of 1 and a new sample of 100, what will our next value look like? Well, if we look up here, our alpha is going to be 1, and our rk plus 1 is going to be 100. So if we plug in those values, that means that qk plus 1 is going to be 50, which is the old value of qk, plus alpha, which is 1, times 100 minus 50, which is equal to 50 plus 50, which is equal to 100. So that means that whenever, and if you, if you do the math, essentially what it means is if we have alpha equal to 1, then we completely trust the most recent sample. See how that works? If alpha is 1, it's always going to equal the, the new sample. But if we say, for example, have alpha equal to 0.5, then the new estimate is going to be halfway between the old estimate and the new sample. So if we plug in 0 0.5, we get qk plus 1 is equal to qk, which was 50, plus 0 0.5 times the new sample minus the old sample, which is now equal to 75. So before I said that if alpha, if alpha is equal to 0.5, then the new estimate is going to lie exactly between the old estimate and the new sample. And that's what happened. So the new estimate was, the new sample was 100, the old estimate was 50, and so it's right between there at 75. Let's look at this graphically. Okay? So here's the formula again. The new estimate is pulled toward the new sample by a linear scaling based on alpha. So if we have qk at 50, and we have alpha equal 1, and the new sample is equal to 100, then here's what happens. We have rk plus 1 equal... What? Wow, okay, these slides, the, the, the order in which text came down, sorry about that, that was really weird. So, here's what happens. In this example, we have our old value of qk equal to 50. Our new sample is k plus, or rk plus 1. That's our newest reward. That's our new sample. That was 100. What we can picture then is alpha, you draw a line between qk and rk plus 1. And however you scale alpha, that's where your new qk plus 1 will be. So if alpha is equal to 1, it will go all the way up here to 100. If alpha is equal to 0.5, then it will be here in the middle at 75. If alpha is equal to 0, then you will never change your estimate. It'll always be the old estimate. Okay? So for example here, yeah, I, I did that wrong. I think what I wanted to do was the following. Let me see if I can fix this real quick. Um... Yeah, I did not want there to be any appearing on these slides. Okay. None. 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 We're doing it live. Okay. So let's go over that once more because I think now it will be fixed. All right. So here's the math we just did. 
So we have QK right here at 50, right? Now we have RK plus one at 100. We introduce our alpha, which in this case is one. And so QK plus one is all the way over here at 100. Perfect. I just had the, the PowerPoint animation was messed up a little bit. I apologize. Now let's look at that same example for an alpha equal to 0 0.5. So I have QK here at 50. I have my new sample over here at 100. I have my alpha right here, which is going to be 0 0.5 of this red line. And so my QK plus one is in the middle here at 75. Okay, perfect. So if I had another sample of 100, for example, if my next sample was also here at 100 and I kept my value of 0 0.5 for alpha, then what I will be left with is this value, right? So what's between that? That's like 12.5, so like 87.5. If my RK plus 2 <laughs> was 100 again, then it would pull it half the way between 75 and RK plus 2. And if I kept going, and if I kept getting a hundreds, it would constantly get closer and closer and closer to believing that it was a hundred, but it would never truly get there, right? But watch this. If I then got a value of zero, then my alpha would bring me half of the way between a hundred and zero, so my new value belief would be at 50, right? So no matter how many samples I had in the future, this is weighting things based on this value of alpha. And it turns out that in practice, a good value of alpha is somewhere between like 0 0.05 and 0 0.2. So you really don't wanna be going half the way there. Typically, since you're doing so many samples, what you wanna do is go maybe 10% of the way there. And you'll very, you'll, it takes you longer to converge to the right answer but if you get like one really variant answer, it's not gonna pull you away from it. So usually you wanna choose alpha around 0.1 is a pretty good value. All right, so that's how the incremental update method works. And we're going to be implementing that on assignment five, but it's, it's super easy. Okay, now we talk, now we know how to, um, what we just discussed was if we had a, an a value estimate of an action, and we have a new sample, how do we update the new average estimate or the new value estimate? So that's what we just did. So now we know how to keep track of our values. Now we have that second part, which is now that we know the values, how do we select our actions, okay? The first way and the easiest is just called greedy action selection. So how do we select an action now that we have our value estimates? Well, the simplest way, as I just said, is just to greedy select. So on any given play T, choose the action A star for which QT of A star is equal to max A of QT of A. And what that just means is the following. I'll go back to the blackboard. So it means Choose the, uh, this is so dirty right now. Let me get rid of some of this stuff. How far will it let me go back? Okay. So it just means choose the action which has the current highest estimate. Okay. So it just says choose the action that for all of my actions, QT of that action is maximized. All right. So that's what this PowerPoint slide says. I'm going to choose the action A star so that the maximum action is chosen based on QT of A. And so what happens here is that this method always exploits current knowledge to maximize immediate reward. There is no sampling or exploration to determine values of another action to see if they may be better. And so the problem with this method, well, the good thing is that it gives you, if at any point in time, you want to get the highest possible reward from just this pull, right? That of based on knowledge you know, you just choose the greedy action. So this is the choosing of your favorite restaurant. That's the greedy action. 
But like I said, if you always do that, then let's say you've never gone to a restaurant before and you go to McDonald's once. If all you do is greedy action selection, you're only going to go to McDonald's for the rest of your life and you'll never try another restaurant. And you'll never try Wendy's, and Wendy's is obviously superior to McDonald's, and so you're losing out, right? If you had just explored a little bit and gone to Wendy's, you could have had a real hamburger rather than going to McDonald's. And that is, that's fact. You can't argue with that. Okay. So, here's another way. It's called Epsilon Greedy Action Selection. And this over here is how PowerPoint's font wants to put in an Epsilon. Greek, Greek letter Epsilon. I just drew it outside of my camera. So here's the Epsilon. I don't know. I'm not very good at drawing it. So to add some exploration, what we can do is we can use Greedy Action Selection, but we can choose a random action with some probability Epsilon. So what this means is, as we choose more and more actions, if we go to infinity, each action will be sampled infinite times. So it guarantees that as Ka goes to infinity, meaning the number of times that we've chosen each action, Qt of A converges to Q star of A. So what this means again, if we use epsilon greedy selection, Let's say epsilon is equal to 0 0.1. That means that 90% of the time, I'm going to choose the greedy action. But 10% of the time, I'm going to choose a random action. So even if it's just 10% of the time, if we pull infinite levers, everything will be chosen an infinite amount of times. So what this means is that as it converges, as we keep pulling and pulling and pulling, Ka, which is the amount of times that each action is chosen, will go to infinity, and the value estimate will approach the true value. And so, in theory, this works. In theory, we can pull a lever infinite times. But in practice, it may take a very, very long time to converge. Okay? So let's just have a look at a graph here. In this graph, what we see is on the bottom, we have the number of time steps. So this can be seen as the number of times that we've chosen an action, okay? And over here, what we see is the average reward that we got from our pulls. So let's say over here, um, we used on the blue graph, we got, a, this was with epsilon equal to zero. So we did not do any random exploration. So what this usually means is that we're going to pull one lever and we're going to keep pulling that lever, okay? Now, that's given some value of 1. That's just a baseline value. Um, this example is explained very thoroughly in the book, so I highly recommend reading the textbook. What we see in green is an epsilon equal to 0 0.1, if you can't see it there. So what happens with epsilon equal to 0 0.1 is that over time our values are going to go up and up and up. And the reason for that is because with 10% of the time, we pull a random action. And so we are exploring more and more, and we're learning the best actions to take because we're learning their values. And so what happens is you can see it slowly, we grow and grow and grow, and we get better actions over time than this blue line. Now, this red line here, and I apologize if you are colorblind, if you are, then the green line is the top line, the red line is the middle line. The middle line has an epsilon of 0 0.01. What this does is that over time, we're only selecting random actions 1% of the time. And so it's going to be learning far slower than if we had selection, selected actions, um, random actions 10% of the time, but over time, we will overtake, right? So it's learning slower, but it's exploiting more. And so what we see 
is the following. So with epsilon equal to 0 0.1, this might be the 0 0.1 line, we get values like this. With epsilon equal to 0 0.01, we may learn slower, but then we eventually pass it once we've learned a significant amount. Because if you think about it, an epsilon of 0 0.1 means 10% of the time we're doing something completely random. And so 10% of our pulls are going to be possibly really bad. Up here, 0 0.01, we're only doing random things 1% of the time. So we're going to learn slower, but we will eventually, once we've learned the same amount, we will be doing random things far less often, so we'll have a higher average reward. See how that works? Um, similarly, let's say we had something like 10 random actions. This is the same graph, but the y-axis means something different. Um, so this is the percent of the time that we chose the optimal action, okay? So here, if we don't use any action uh, random randomization, so we ha if we have epsilon equal to zero, then well, if we chose the wrong thing the first time, we're probably going to keep choosing the wrong thing forever because we're not exploring. In the green line, we see epsilon equal to 0 0.1, right? So we are going to learn over time which is the optimal action. And on the red line here in the middle, we see that very slowly we are learning, not as quickly as 0 0.1, but much slower we are learning um, the actions values over time. Now again, this one, this is the 0 0.1, and sorry, this is the 0 0.01, and this is the 0 0.1. So look at what this means. This graph is the percent of the time that we choose the optimal action. So let's say we have 10 actions. The maximum value, so once, once the green line has learned to infinity, if it's choosing random actions 10% of the time, then the maximum percent of the time that it could choose the optimal action is 90%, right? So even after it's made a, like a million trillion pulls and it has the real values, it's still doing random actions 10% of the time. So eventually, even after it's learned, it can only make the right choice 90% of the time. But it learns really quickly. For the second line here, if it's doing random things 1% of the time, then after it eventually does learn, which is far slower than the 10% case, it will be making the right choice 99% of the time. So this is a really important lesson. And it's that based on our value of epsilon, what's happening is um, we are trading learning speed for eventual accuracy. Okay? So what some people will do is over time, they will start out with a higher value of epsilon so that they learn faster. But over time, they change their value of epsilon to be much smaller. So let's say up here, we changed our value of epsilon to 0 0.01, then we would be making mistakes far less frequently. Okay, so that's what epsilon does in a, in a visual way. Okay, so our bandit algorithm implementation then goes something like this. Step one, we're going to choose a value update method, whether it's the averaging or the incremental. We choose one of those. Then we choose an action selection method. So then what we do, once we've made these two choices, remember these are the important choices, we just repeat the following forever. Choose an action to perform, get the return from your bandit, sorry, that should be reward here, the reward from your bandit, and then update the value for your action. So if we look back at our blackboard, this is what we were doing, right? We were, choosing a, we were choosing an action to perform, getting the reward from the bandit, then updating the value. Then choosing an action to perform, getting the re reward from the bandit, and then updating the value. And so this is sort of like a never-ending process, and that's why we have it in this loop here. Choose an action, get the reward, update the value. Perfect. 
So let's have a look at that in algorithmic form. So this would be how you would implement, for example, the incremental average formula update with epsilon greedy action selection. Okay, this would be the algorithm for that. So we have some function, it's called bandit algorithm, and it's going to take in the bandits. So the bandits are implemented, however. We're going to have our Q array, and the Q array is going to store our value estimates of each bandit. And originally, this is going to just be an array of zeros, and that array is going to have the same size as the number of bandits. And the array at index i is going to be our estimate of value i, or, or of bandit i. Similarly, we're also going to keep track of how many times we've actually pulled the lever of each bandit. Okay, so how many times each one this uh, action has been selected. So this n here, that was actually equal to k back in, in previous slides. Then, while true, so we repeat this forever, we're going to set our action to null if it initially, just to have a variable that we can store. So, if random is less than epsilon, so what this does, um, we're, if let's just say that this rand function returns a value between zero and one, okay? So if rand returns a value between zero and one, and that value is less than our epsilon, so for example, let, let me draw this out because this is not completely obvious. So over here, we've got zero and we've got one. Now let's say that we have a value for epsilon of 0 0.2, okay? So what this means is that 20% of the time we want to choose a random action. So how do we actually do something? How do we write in code 20% of the time I want something to happen. Well, what we're going to do is over here, this rand, this is going to generate a random number between 0 and 1, and that's going to fall somewhere on this line. Okay? And wherever it falls, we say, is that value less than epsilon? If it is, then that is part of that 20%. If it's not, then it's part of the other 80%, okay? So if it fell here at 0 0.4, well, that's not true. If it fell here at 0 0.1, then it, it is true, okay? Okay. So if it is true, right, if we hit our epsilon, then our action is going to be equal to a random action. That's what we're going to do. Otherwise, this is the greedy part of epsilon greedy, if we haven't hit our epsilon, then we're going to take the maximum valued action from our Q array. So this just means take the maximum A from Q of A. Then we've chosen the action. So what we're going to do is we're going to index the bandits array by the action index, and we're going to get the value from that bandit. And that's the reward that we get at this time step. Then we increment the number of times that we've chosen that action, right? And the n array stores how many times we've chosen each action, so we just increase it by one. And then we increment, we increment using the incremental average formula. So we have QA, which is our new estimate, is equal to QA, so remember, before we said Q T plus one, this is now in like actual programming language. When we say QA equals QA plus something, this QA is the previous value, and this QA is going to be the newly updated value, okay? So the new QA will be equal to the old QA plus one over NA, right? Remember how we had one over k plus one last time? That's what that's what this is. One over n a times the reward that we got minus q of a. That's it. So that is the bandit algorithm implementation using the incremental average update and epsilon greedy action selection. Really, really simple stuff. And I'm sure you can all do that. Okie doke. Now let's talk about another algorithm that we could use called upper confidence bound. 
Excuse me. So exploration is needed because there's uncertainty about the accuracy of action value estimates. So what that means is that the whole reason we need to explore is because we're not sure about values, right? So greedy looks good right now, but it may not be the best overall. Epsilon greedy accomplishes our task, right? It explores, but it explores randomly. Can we do better than random exploration? Yes, we can. So we could be better if we select among non-greedy actions that may be close to optimal with some measure for how certain we are about the values. And so what that means is instead of just using epsilon greedy and choosing a random action to do, we're going to choose an action that has a balance between known accuracy and how many times that we've sampled it. And that's what UCB is going to do. Okay. So use, this is the formula. It's actually called UCB1, upper confidence bound one. But here is the actual formula. And we'll go through this step by step. Um, so LNT is the natural log of T. So up here, we can see natural log of T. Here, NT of A, that's the number of times that action A was selected. So up here, we've got the square root of the natural log of t divided by the number of times that a was selected. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that as we increase the number of times that an action was selected, this value goes down. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, my, my uh, thing is in the way here. Okay, so as we increase, so as we increase the number of times that an action is selection, this term here goes down over time. Okay? That's the important part. We see outside that there's this C. So this C value is going to multiply on this term. Okay? And this is going to control the degree of exploration. And what we mean by that, I'll come back to that in a second. Typically what we do is we try all possible actions once before we start selecting using this. So what the square root term is, if you've done any statistics, this is sort of like the variance, okay? So the square root of the number of times we've sampled it divided, sorry, the natural log of the number of samples, this is the overall number of samples, divided by the number of times we've chosen a particular action, this is essentially the variance of a given sample. So that's sort of a, an estimate of the uncertainty, right? So if this is a measure of variance or uncertainty, then as that goes down, our certainty goes up. And that makes sense because the number, if we, if we increase the number of times we've we played a slot machine, our uncertainty goes down. Our certainty goes up. Okay, so this function calculates a sort of upper bound on the true value of action A. So that's why it's called a upper confidence bound. As nt of A increases, the uncertainty goes down. When t increases, but not nt of A, uncertainty goes up. So T, let me, let me increase this, let me, let me look at this again. Let me go back to the blackboard. So here we see um, over here, KA, this is that, um, what was that value in our spreadsheet? One second. So here NT is equal to three. If we're talking about the UCB formula, NT is equal to three, here nt is equal to 2, here it's equal to 2, and here it's equal to 2. But t, the big T, is the sum of all of those. So that's 9. Okay? So let's go back to the PowerPoint and we'll see how that works. If we increase nt of a, then our certainty of the value of that action goes up. 
But if we increase the total number of actions, but not increase the actions of this particular slot machine, then our uncertainty goes up. And what does that mean? Well, once again, back to the blackboard, it means that if we keep, for example, if we keep increasing t, so let's say now we're up to t equals 100, right? But my nt for this one is still 3. So let's say I've pulled this one 30 times and this one 30 times and this one 30 times, but this one is still 3, <clears throat> excuse me, then relative to the other bandits, my uncertainty about this bandit's value is very high, okay? So going back to the PowerPoint, I know this is a little bit confusing, but this will eventually click. As T goes up, uncertainty about specific values goes up. As NT goes up, uncertainty about that specific value goes down, okay? And what this means is, we are trying to choose the action that maximizes this value. And so the action that maximizes this value are the ones that have fewer visits. But that's also combined with the value of the action itself. So what UCB is doing is you're choosing an action which maximizes a formula which combines our current estimate of the value of the action with our uncertainty of that action. So you combine these and then you can play with this slider of C to increase the exploration. Why does it increase exploration? Because if C was equal to zero, then we would be doing greedy action selection because all we would be doing is maximizing our value. As C goes up, we multiply the term based on uncertainty. And as we multiply that term and that goes higher and higher, then we are choosing more and more frequently other actions rather than um, the action with the highest value, okay? So I know that was a bit of a mouthful. I hope that by the end it made a little bit sense. Over time, we're becoming more and more certain about each action but we are still factoring in uncertainty when it comes to exploration versus Epsilon Greedy where once in a while we just choose a random action, okay? So what this can lead to, typically Epsilon Greedy is going to converge a little bit faster, right? But over time, UCB is going to give us better average rewards, okay? So typically, if you have lots and lots and lots of plays, UCB is great. If you have um, less time or less samples, then you may want to use Epsilon Greedy. Okay. Whew. A lot of talking today. I want to end off with a quick mention of what we'll talk about in the future, which is the notion of Q of A versus Q of S comma A. So Q of A, as we've talked about before, this is our estimate of the value of doing action A, okay? So when we go back to the slot, to the slot machines here, Q of A, let me, Q of A was our current estimate of this action, our current estimate of this action, our current estimate of this action or this action, right? But, ah, uh, okay. So Q of A is the value of doing action A. The v but however, the value of a specific action will vary depending on the state in which it was issued, okay? So now that we're factoring in state, we have to have a little bit more information. So for example, if we're doing pathfinding, right? Let's say we choose to move up the value of moving up might be really good if we are at a state in which we are below the goal, right? Because by choosing up, we're going toward the goal. But if we're at another state that isn't below the goal, moving up is probably not what we want to do. And so what this means is that 
Q of S comma A, which we will be using going forward, is the value of a given action at a given state. Okay? So, for example, if we're doing some pathfinding, right, so this is from assignment two. I'm sure you're sick of looking at something like this. So say we're at a current state, a current X, Y location, and we have these, we can move up, down, left, and right. So these are our actions X and Y. So now if we turn these actions into integers, right, we can think of this as the n-armed bandit problem, right? We want to try up a few times. We want to try down a few times. We want to try left a few times and see how close it gets us to our eventual goal. So if we are at a current state, right, we're at a current state, there are four actions to choose from. So now, instead of just having Q of an action, which is going to be different based on what state we're in, now we're just going to have this new um, syntax, which is Q of S comma A. So this up here, this would store the value of going up at state S. This would store the value of going left at state S, right? So essentially, if we wanted to do something like pathfinding, but with the n but solve it using something like the n armed bandit problem, that and then at each state in our environment, we would have um, an n armed bandit problem. So we would have to store the Q values of all the actions for every state. And so now we have Q S of Q of S A instead of just Q of A. All right. So that's the end of the slides for this lecture. Uh, let's go back here real quick. So I got a number of questions um, from people who are just obviously not in the, uh, the class. If you want to see um, the lectures, you can. I will post the link here in the chat. Um, next time, we'll be getting into something called Markov decision processes, which are pretty cool. And uh, we'll be moving on until we get to Monte Carlo methods and temporal difference learning. And temporal difference learning is going to be super, super cool. And that's what assignment five is going to be on. Um, and specifically the Q learning algorithm. So all of this is building up. We're building up in baby steps into be able to actually perform reinforcement learning. And these action value estimates are one of the basic building blocks that we'll need. Okay, so uh, on Tuesday, we'll be talking about Markov decision processes, and I will also be showing off um, the tournament for assignment three. So that'll be super, super cool. Thank you all for tuning in, and I'll see you on Tuesday.